Well, I'm going to get things started. I think we may have more people joining us as we uh, get going, but um, just kind of taking a look at the participants list and seeing who's joined and uh, comparing them a little bit with our RSVPs, but I'll, I'll get things started. And I'm sure that uh, we might have a few more participants that, that join as we get going. Um, so welcome. Thank you for uh, spending your lunch hour and your early afternoon with us. My name is Paul Ingram. I'm the Growth Management Director at the Puget Sound Regional Council. And we really appreciate you being with us today that um, over the past three years, we've been working a lot on updating the regional plan, Vision 2050. And during that process, we heard um, consistently from the public, from our board members, from cities and counties about the issue of uh, access to housing that's affordable to people. And that that's an issue that is different in different parts of the region. It varies between Seattle and Tacoma or Seattle and North Bend. Um, diff it's different in different communities. And yet we heard that housing, housing costs is an issue throughout the region. So um, one of the things that our board did was to update a number of the housing strategies, a number of the housing policies, I should say, um, but also direct staff to begin work on a regional housing strategy. And so this is one of the first steps. Uh, today, uh, Laura Benjamin on our staff is going to lead you through um, the early findings of a regional housing needs assessment. Um, but we also want to have some discussion with you to get some feedback from you um, about your reactions to some of the, these early findings and data um, and how you might be able to follow up with us as we continue on this work. I want to caution you that this isn't uh, having the solutions to the housing problem. Um, this is an early look at some of the data, um, but um, but nonetheless, I think it'll be for a good discussion. The PowerPoint slides and materials shared today um, will be um, emailed to an attendee or will make available uh, next week to everybody that's uh, on the list. Um, there's also a video recording of the presentation and that'll be made available later. Um, so I just wanna talk through the agenda real quick to kind of orient everybody. Um, the agenda is linked in the reminder email um, so you can look it up as well there. And I think that we're going to add in the chat a link to that um, so that you can come back to it as needed. So we're it, today's uh, session is really uh, three parts. I'm going to look at it here uh, just to make sure I get it right. So after we do a quick welcome, we're going to do part one. What does it cost to be housed? So really looking at the cost of housing um, in the region, um, rents and housing prices, have some discussion with you about those costs. Um, and then part two is how does this affect people? Looking at the impact of housing costs on people and families. And part three, what is needed to address these gaps? So then again, some discussion about that. So that's our agenda today. Um, some basic Zoom etiquette and protocols that you're all familiar with. Uh, make sure that your mic is muted, except when you're talking. Make sure you're, if you can, if you go to the participants icon, you can change how your name is listed in Zoom. So you can um, list your first and last name um, and, and list an organization if you like. During the presentation, please send any questions or comments to the host named Housing q and in the, in the chat. So we have a staff person who's listed as Housing Q&A. Um, that will um, provide these questions and comments to the presenters and allow the presenters to, to keep organized with how we can uh, respond to questions that come up. And if you're having technical difficulties or have a question regarding Zoom features, um, I know we've all been using lots of Zoom and other tools, but um, certainly uh, it seems like there's always a technical issue whenever we work through some of these things. Um, we also have um, somebody in chat that's named Zoom support. So if you, if you uh, directly chat with uh, Zoom support, they can give you some guidance about how to uh, operate the Zoom session. When you are delegated to a breakout room, uh, please leave your microphone muted um, unless uh, you're ready to make a comment. And use of your video is optional, but we would love for you to turn on your video during those breakout sessions. Um, if you're calling in over the phone, 
Uh, you may toggle mute, unmute by pressing star six. And closed captions are available during the Zoom. They should be listed in the lower portion of your Zoom window with the CC icon. So hopefully that covers all the basics that you need to know to be able to work through this work session. Again, I wanna extend a big thank you for participating with us and helping us with this important work. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Laura Benjamin, um, our senior planner that's been leading our housing efforts to uh, take you through the presentation. Thank you, Paul, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for spending an extended lunch hour with us or two hours with us. So before we dive into the data, I just wanted to give a little bit more background about the strategy and kind of ground you and what we'll be talking about today. Um, so as Paul mentioned, the regional housing strategy is an early vision 2050 implementation item. There are three key components to the strategy, the regional housing needs assessment, tools and actions and implementation and monitoring. So today we're really focusing on the regional housing needs assessment, looking at that data, looking at the, uh, what data measures we looked at, what the findings are telling us, um, and really wanting to make sure that we're all kind of grounded in this data and that we're kind of telling the best and most uh, comprehensive data story we can so that that can help inform conversations around tools and actions. Uh, the strategy as a whole is on track to be completed uh, next year in late 2021. We plan to have a full draft report for the regional housing needs assessment later this year. We'll let folks know when that is available. And we will be kicking off um, the strategy discussions around tools and actions early next year. So we'll kind of be transitioning from the data to what do we do next next year. Quick data overview. Um, the first looking at sources, most of these are going to look pretty familiar for folks who um, have seen PSRC data work in the past. We use census data, data from HUD, um, some PSRC data around um, housing permits and employment. Did want to note a few things that are still forthcoming. We are working with Coast, uh, the CoStar database on market rate rental data. We should have more on that soon. And we are also updating PSRC's subsidized housing um, project database, so more on that as well. In terms of geographies, um, again, a lot of these are pretty standard for PSRC, looking at regions, counties, the regional geographies that are tied to the regional growth strategy and Vision 2050. Uh, one geography to note that is different is sub areas. So a sub area, there are two to three per county. And they're really intended to serve as a market shed. So one thing we heard when we uh, started doing some scoping work for the data um, was that local jurisdictions had an understanding of what was going on in their city and they knew what was going on in the county, but they wanted to have a better idea of what was going on with kind of surrounding jurisdictions in those market sheds. So the sub areas kind of lets us see some of those nuances that are lost when we roll up some of the data at the county or the regional uh, level. We also will have data for regional growth centers and some high capacity transit areas coming as well. Um, and then just wanted to, you know, be upfront about limitations, obviously the timeliness of this data. Uh, most of this data is for 2018 to 2019, so we're not capturing the impacts of the pandemic. That's something that we're aware of, and as new data becomes available, um, we will do our best to update some of these measures. Also, not all of the data can be spliced at all the various geographies, just given the, the limitations on, on the data source and ground truthing as well. This really is a quantitative data analysis. Um, we are planning to hold some focus groups with residents later this year to talk to them about their lived experiences with housing access and affordability and realizing that that is a data source in itself, that hearing what people are going through in their day-to-day -day is something that we need um, to include in this report as well. So that is forthcoming. Um, before we dive into the data too, just wanna thank all the PSRC staff, all the local staff um, who are part of the, the LUTAC group and other housing committees um, who have helped to really dig into the technical analysis of this. It really has been a team effort. So with that, we will start with part one. What does it cost to be housed? Simply put, it costs a lot. So we have seen rent and home values uh, rise dramatically over the past decade from 2010 to 2018. Rents increased 53% and home values increased 67% across the region. Looking at home value more specifically, we see it's um, an upward trend in all four counties with maybe some stabilization in King County more recently. 
We also see there's a growing gap among the counties. Um, and also that in places like Kitsap County and Pierce County, where, which have um, historically had some more affordable areas, with that upward trend, they're becoming less affordable. We also wanted to look at um, the distribution of home value. So it's one thing to look at the median, but we wanted to kind of see what was going on within the spread. And what we see is that about one in 10 homes in the region um, are valued at over $1 million and that most of these homes are in King County. Then looking more specifically at rents, again, we see this upward trend in all four counties. It looks like there might be some stabilization um, in Snohomish County, but again, um, probably would want more data before coming to that conclusion. Growing gap among all four counties. Um, and as I mentioned on the earlier slide, we will have much more rental data soon um, looking at it for counties, for sub areas, regional growth centers, really being able to kind of splice and dice it to tell us a lot more. So stay tuned on that. We will share more when that is available. So what is contributing to housing prices? What is going on here? We see there's a lot of uh, demand, strong uh, job growth has led to a surge in demand for housing. So here we see jobs in the orange bars, housing in the purple bars, and really that um, jobs really historic growth following the, the, the Great Recession really from that 2010, 2011 period, seeing that uptick and that housing production um, kind of lagged and took a while to really uh, ramp up with that. Obviously looking at jobs and housing is not a one-to-one -one comparison. There's often more than one employee in a household, but still a way to kind of look at demand. So we see that from 2010 to 2016, for every four new jobs that the region added, it added one new housing unit. So really there was that lag with job growth and housing production. Another way to look at this is population growth. Um, another demand um, kind of stressing our housing production. So we see population growth is, um, or annual population change, I should say, um, is that orange bar kind of at the top of the chart and annual housing unit change is that teal line towards the bottom. So we do see an upward trend in housing production with that teal line kind of starting in 2011. Housing production is um, picking up, trying to keep pace. Um, but again, we see that population growth has outpaced housing production um, from 2010 to 2019. Uh, the region added three new residents for every one new housing unit. So just an, another way to look at that. And something to keep in mind with all of this is that we anticipate that the region is going to continue to grow. So not only do we need to play catch up a bit for um, the growth we've experienced in recent years, but we're also anticipating um, that there will be about 5.8 million people and 3.4 million jobs in the region by the year 2050. Other things contributing to housing costs, median increase, um, income has increased. So overall, um, across the region, median incre income has an upward trend. But when we look at the distribution, we see that one in four households um, has an income of less than $50,000. So we wanna make sure that while there's this upward trend in median income, we don't want it to mask the fact that there are still many, many residents in the region who um, have low to moderate incomes. Also, when we look at median income by race and ethnicity, we see some disparities there. Um, compared to a white or an Asian household, Latinx households earn about 40% less and black households earn about 60% less. Other factors contributing to housing cost, um, housing production has slowed in the, in the last decade. So obviously we're still missing a year to complete this decade and the, for the bar on the far right, but we see overall um, from 2010 to 2019, or from 2010 to 2019, King County is the only county on pace uh, to build more than the past decade. So really slowing down of housing production. And then that raises the question of what is being built. Um, and it's primarily multifamily. So since 2010, the region has added over 124,000 multifamily um, units to the region. Some points of comparison. In 2010, about 55% of new housing produced was uh, detached single family versus in 2019, about 30% of housing units produced are detached single family. Looking at where many of these units are being built, um, about a third of 
regional housing production is occurring in regional growth centers. Um, so that one way to think about this is that regional growth centers account for about just less than 3% of land in the UGA and about a third of our housing production is being accommodated in these um, such a small land mass. So we have some dense multifamily housing being built. We also see that the inventory of homes for sale remains low. Um, we have seen some fluctuation in recent years, but generally speaking, lower than it was before the Great Recession. And we also look, when we look at the housing stock, we see that the majority of homes are single family, about 60% of housing units in the region are detached single family. So another way to look at um, kind of housing stock is looking at missing middle or middle density um, units. These are kind of units that bridge the gap between a detached single family home and more dense multifamily development. So something like a townhome, a duplex, a triplex, um, kind of that moderate density there. So, we looked at King County assessor data as kind of a representative data set to see um, if and how missing middle homes, um, what their cost was compared to some other housing types. So we saw that um, overall, um, what we consider to be a, a moderate density or missing middle housing type tend to cost less. Here you see there the townhomes in orange and the low to mid rise condo in green. Um, in this case, townhomes cost about 31% less than a detached single family home. So don't have a lot of this, this missing middle housing, but it can provide some slightly more affordable home, home ownership options. But when we look at um, owner occupied housing by kind of this density by units and structure, we see that it's predominantly single family. So that teal um, in some cases, it's getting into the like 85, 90% of owner of owner occupied homes are single family um, and getting into that mid, uh, what we would consider that missing middle, that moderate density, that orange, uh, limited ownership opportunities. Looking at tenure, we see that the region is increasingly comprised of renters. We saw an, uh, an uptick in renters in around 2011, um, following the effects of the Great Recession, and that can um, remain somewhat constant in the past few years. We also see some disparities in housing tenure by race, ethnicity. Um, Black and Latinx households are more likely to rent than own. We also see that about 68% of white households own their home, whereas only about 48% of person of color households own their home. Then looking at how our households are comprised, um, we see that about nearly two thirds of our households are comprised of related people. Um, this is what the census would call a family household, but what um, can be a little tricky is just because it's a family household doesn't necessarily tell us the age or the kind of the composition of um, household members beyond the fact that they're related. So digging in a little bit more, we see that about one in three households have children under the age of 18. And we see that slightly over one in three households include a person over the age of 60. Um, so lots of related people living together. See kind of this growing increase of households with a senior um, person in the home and perhaps not as many um, households with children as we may think. And something to keep in mind is as um, the region grows, as we look to the future, some demographic changes we are anticipating um, is a larger percentage of our population will, will be over the age of 65, that our region will be more diverse, um, with a lot of our uh, population grow, growth being people of color, and that people will be in smaller households. So not only needing to acknowledge kind of how our households are um, composed today, but changes we're expecting in the future. So looking at jobs housing balance, so this is the ratio of jobs to housing in a geography. So this looks at the region as a whole, which is that circle in purple versus the counties. Uh, we see that King County has more jobs than housing and that the other counties have more housing than jobs. So kind of an imbalance of jobs and housing in the region. 
Another way we can look at kind of the relationship between um, jobs and housing is commute flow. So we have data looking from where people live and where they're commuting to work and back. So we see that about one in three residents live and work in different counties. So they live in one county, they're commuting to a different county for work and then coming back to come home. Um, so I am gonna kind of explain this chart. There's one for each county. I'm gonna ex explain King County and then we'll kind of quickly walk through the others. Um, this is something that I really recommend that once the slides are available, you can kind of dig it into more detail. But so what this chart is telling us, um, kind of King County there you can see on the far right in the purple is highlighted. Um, you see that about 8,900,000 people, um, that circle arrow live and work in the county. About 40,000 or 41,000 um, leave the region. That's that arrow pointing to the right to get to work. About 54,000 go to Snohomish County, about 6,000 go to Kitsap County and about 48,000 go to Pierce County. So that's kind of what those arrows are showing. Who lives and works in the same county and who is commuting to a different county. So here's what we see in Kitsap. About 43,000 people live and work in Kitsap County, a large percentage, almost 26,000 are going to King. In Pierce, we see about 184,000 living and working in Pierce. Again, a large percentage going to King County and a good chunk also leaving to go outside the region. And finally, looking at Snohomish County, about 171,000 people live and work in Snohomish County. Again, good chunk of folks going to King, um, about 24,000 leaving the region to get to work. So again, recommend taking a closer look at these when the slide deck is available. So with that, we have made it through part one. I think I will stop sharing my screen in just a minute so we can answer some questions. And then after we get through some questions as the full group, we will split up into our breakouts um, to hear from you in a bit more detail. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm going to turn to Liz who has so kindly renamed herself Housing Q&A. Great. Um, so we've had so far just one question come in. Please feel free to send in some questions. But from Randy Banneker um, with Seattle King County Realtors, are you seeing an increase in vehicle miles traveled home to work over time? Are people searching farther from their homes, uh, their from their jobs for housing affordability? That's a great question. So I think for the data that was presented, we didn't look at trends, it was kind of a point in time. And I see Carol has popped up and unmuted as well. So Carol, anything else you'd like to add to that? No, just that that's a, um, that's a great suggestion and um, we can look into pulling that information together. Thank you. So um, feel free to keep sending in questions. We've got a, a good note here on um, one of the, an adjustment to one of the graphics, um, but uh, please let us know if you have any other questions. I think it works for folks. We'll maybe pause for a minute or two just in case folks are typing. But if it doesn't look like we're getting more questions then we can transition to the breakout rooms in another minute or two. Uh, great. So we've got a question from Aaron. Um, how do you anticipate your commute patterns and housing demand to change during and post COVID? That is a good question. Um, and I think that's one where we don't really know yet. Um, obviously, there's a lot of anecdotal data out there that, you know, you had a friend that moved somewhere, a family member who's, you know, making some different choices. But um, we have some um, some early um, data from the census, but in terms of kind of some larger data sets where that really allow us to kind of dig in to see what type of shifts, whether they be short-term or long-term are happening. I think that's something we're, we're continuing to monitor. Um, and we just, we don't have a great answer just yet. 
And yeah, Lauren, I I'll just add that we'll be maybe Carol, you were just going to say this, but we'll be updating uh, or redoing or doing once again our household travel survey where we survey people on on their uh, travel behavior. We'll be doing that next year, which will be a great opportunity to be look at to look at how travel behavior has changed um, post COVID. Is that what you're going to say, Carol? <laughs> Well, I was going to add to that, uh, our survey also asks where people live and where people have moved. So when we collect that data, we'll have a little bit more information about housing mobility and some of the choices that people might have made uh, in the past uh, or during the COVID times. I will chime in with one last comment to say that I think um, it's an excellent question. We are all wondering what the impacts of uh, the current pandemic are going to have, not just on you know household location decisions, but um, on the um, on on job location decisions and whatnot. Um, we are tracking this with uh, with with data as we can, uh, with the most current data that we can. Um, as Laura mentioned, there is some anecdotal evidence of some households um, sort of using the flexibility provided by, you know, sort of teleworking to perhaps, you know, sort of make, uh, uh, be able to sort of make decisions to, to locate further from their jobs um, and or maybe look for a little bit more space. Um, we have no idea to what extent those trends are, um, are, are temporary, um, whether they will, you know, or whether they'll have some lasting impact. Um, but we'll continue to track these things as we can. Okay, I'm seeing a couple more questions here. Um, this from Kristen Jewell. Do you have data? Uh, do you have data on how the commute flow intersects with incomes? For example, are higher income households more likely to commute out of the counties where they live? What would they? What would this indicate about opportunities for the intersection of economic development, especially for lower income households? That is a great question and a great suggestion. Um, the commute float data that we just showed you on the slides did not factor that in. I know um, some other jurisdictions are looking at it that way. So I think there's some uh, methodology and some uh, precedent for that. So that's definitely something we could look into. Um, this from Allison Butcher, any data on seniors, retirees leaving the region altogether due to lack of affordability? Um, we will talk a bit more about displacement in part two. I don't think we spliced that data specifically for seniors. Um, so that is a great question. I think um, when we looked at displacement, we looked more by race, ethnicity and by tenure. But I think that's something that if we if the data allows looking at it um, from kind of that life cycle perspective as well would be very interesting. Um, this from Mike Catterman, uh, the decrease in housing production for the current decade was surprising given the record activity we have experienced in our city for the past three years. Have you broken it out by year to see whether the decade is trending up in the last half of the decade? Yes, so we have broken it out by year. That is something we will definitely share um, in the draft report. Um, and I believe was also on the, um, there was that chart that was telling a lot that had um, annual housing change as well as population change. And we do see an upward trend. I think really where we um, look at 2010 to 2019, why it seems so low is because there was such a big lag following the, the Great Recession. And it really wasn't until about 2016, 2017 when we started to see housing production starting to actually keep pace with growth. So it's just kind of then how do we account for that lag for those several years? Great. Uh, I'm seeing a few questions that I think will be answered in future sessions. Um, and so maybe just in the interest of time, we can hold off and see about returning to those um, if we are not unanswered later. I think that sounds great. And I think Paul mentioned it as well, but I just want to reiterate, um, you know, given time, if we don't get to your question today, or if you have follow ups, if we did get to your question, um, I'm available, Carol's available, there's other PSRC staff available as well. So we, we really think of this as an ongoing conversation. So um, always more to come. But with that, we will transition to our first of uh, the breakout discussions. Um, so there, each of the breakout discussion groups will have two PSRC staff with you, one acting as a facilitator and a second to take notes. 
We will be compiling these notes and sharing them after the session, just because you can't be in each breakout group at the same time. Um, as Paul mentioned, the breakout group questions are on the agenda on page two. Um, it was included in the email, but really just wanting to hear your thoughts on what findings are important to bring into future strategy discussions. You know, what are the key things we need to be messaging to our, to our elected officials as they're thinking about actions and tools? Are there, is there anything else needed to reinforce some of these findings? Do things need more context? Do we need to think about how we're messaging things? And then also if there's anything missing or hard to understand. So with that I will pause and I think we will Zoom will just take us into the breakout discussions. Um, attendees should not have to do anything. Zoom will, will do the heavy lifting for us. So we will reconvene um, as a large group in about 15 minutes. All right, so it looks like we're all back. Thanks for joining us. This is one of the benefits of the virtual meeting is that we can go back and forth without, ha without having to physically go back and forth. So we are on to part two. So kind of knowing what we know about changes in housing cost and demand and different market trends, how does this affect people? So first wanna just kind of provide some context to AMI, area median income, which is the term we're going to be using quite a bit for the rest of the presentation. So obviously um, just a quick median refresher. Um, if you are earning median income, that means about half of folks earn less than you and half earn more. So some examples, when we say 80% AMI, that could be one full-time worker earning $33 an hour. An example there could be an accountant, or if there were two income earners, you could have an office clerk and a security guard. For a household earning 50% AMI, so this is getting into very low income. This could be um, a starting teacher with a salary of around $37,000 or a restaurant cook. And for a household earning 30% AMI, which is considered, you know, very low, extremely low income, um, this could be a full-time worker earning about $12 an hour, which is not too far off from um, minimum wage, someone like a cashier or a home health aide. So just some context when we kind of talk about these different income thresholds. All right, so first and foremost, looking at cost burden. So before we kind of get into exactly what this chart is telling us, what is cost burden? So a household is considered cost burden if they spend more than 30% of their income on housing costs or more than 50% of their income on housing costs, they're then severely cost burden. So housing costs can be mortgage payments, rent payments, um, if you pay for parking, utilities, things like that. And what we see is that more than a third of moderate income renters spend the majority of their income on housing. So more than 50% of their income on housing. And that overall, almost one in two renters are cost burdened. Um, one thing with cost burden that's really important to note is that it's a relative measure. So what we really wanna focus on are these top bars, um, these lower income folks. So for example, this top bar here for a household earning $20,000 or less, um, you know, over 60% of these folks are earning, are spending more than 50% of their income on household costs. So these are folks who we would probably consider to be housing unstable, that they are often one unexpected bill, one medical emergency away from, um, from losing their home, having to make those decisions of, do I pay the rent? Do I pay, pay utilities? Do we buy food? Um, so while these people may be housed and are able to pay their rent now, um, don't want to gloss over the fact that this is, you know, really tenuous situation for our very low income and even moderate income households. Looking at cost burden by race and ethnicity, we see um, people of color, specifically American Indian, Black and Latinx households are more likely to be cost burdened than white and Asian households. So some disparities there by race and ethnicity. 
Another way we can look at this is housing availability. Um, this is a really interesting one. So in this analysis, a unit is considered affordable and available if the unit is vacant or it's occupied by a household earning that AMI threshold or below. So what this really is telling us um, is it accounts for down renting. So if a market rate rental, if we're looking at market rate rentals, looking at the total number that fall within a certain income threshold for, affo uh, for affordability doesn't tell the whole story because of this down renting phenomenon that there could be higher income folks living in those units. Um, so just to explain this one here, so we're gonna focus on the bar on the right for the region. So what this is saying, it's a ratio. So this is saying that for every 100 renters that fall into that zero to 80% AMI bracket, there are 74 units that are, that are affordable at that zero to 80% AMI. So already a gap there that for 100 units only, or for 100 renters, there are only 74 units. But then when we dig a little deeper, we actually see that only 43 of those units are affordable and available. So 31 of those units are being rented by someone at above 80% AMI. So just kind of more nuanced way to look at what's happening with, uh, happening with our market rate rentals. We also see there is continued difficulty for prospective first time buyers to own a home. So this is the housing affordability index for first time buyers. Um, an index at 100 means that a median priced home would be affordable to a household earning median income with some assumptions about, you know, mortgage and lending rates and things like that. Um, an index below 100 means it's getting less affordable and the index numbers above 100 means there's more affordable. So you can see looking back um, all the way to, and back in 2010, all four counties were below 100, meaning they were less affordable. And then we saw some upticks in kind of that 2011, 2012, 2013 period um, following the Great Recession. And then we see now again, looking into the 2019, 2020 period, um, all four counties again are below that 100, meaning that they're less affordable. So difficult for first time buyers, perhaps um, folks who are currently renting and want to buy um, aren't having the option to do that. Um, obviously, you know, if, when it comes to own versus rent, we're really trying to look at this from the point of providing equitable choices for folks. Um, if someone wants to rent their whole life, that is great. And we want to make sure that our housing stock and our housing market provides that. If someone wants to transition from renting to owning, we want to make sure that there are those choices as well. So this is one way to look at that. We also wanted to look at um, how housing costs are affecting people's ability to stay in their communities or looking at displacement. Um, so a little background on this data, um, as I believe was mentioned earlier today, um, PSRC conducts a household travel survey um, asking folks to keep a travel diary for a time period. And in the 2019 survey for the first time, it included questions asking households if they'd moved in the past year and if so, why? So this was really trying to get at the concept of residential displacement. Um, the eight options that were provided um, as answers are listed below. Some of these we see as kind of positive things, people moving for you know a positive choice someone wanted to upgrade more space, better schools. So that's someone really making the choice to do that. But then these four options on the right, we see as kind of being negative factors, perhaps associated with displacement. So um, being forced to move, housing costs going up and needing to move to somewhere more affordable. So when we see this, we see um, people of color were more likely to move for these negative reasons. So people of color shown with that teal bar, versus white households um, with that orange bar uh, with housing costs being that top reason for people of color. We also Martin, see that is this- Is this for renters only or for renters and owners? Uh, this does, I will get to that in just a second. This is for, for both uh, renters and owners. So we see that this affects um, 
about renters more than owners, but about 35% of renters versus only about 15% of owners. And if you want uh, more information on this displacement, there's some great uh, bl blog posts on psrc.org that, that dive into this data a bit more on displacement and what we learned from the 2019 household travel survey. And then also looking at homelessness, we see we know that it is, is a growing concern in our region. Um, since 2008, the region has seen a 12% increase in unhoused people. Um, in King County alone, there was a 30% increase in unhoused people since 2008. Um, so obviously there are many factors and variables that contribute to um, an increase in the number of unhoused people in our region. But we do know that um, increasing housing costs, um, as we talked about before with cost burdened and you know, severely cost burdened, very low income households, um, you know, often on the verge of being unhoused if they um, you know, have very low income having to choose between paying housing costs versus medical bills or things like that, um, that we really see, see that this is a crisis for many people. And that is we have for part two is a bit shorter than part one. Uh, so we're gonna do the same thing we did before. I will stop sharing my screen. We will have some questions and then we'll have some time in our breakout groups. maybe give people a minute or two to type and I will turn it over to Liz. So we've got a couple of few questions have come through and a couple of good suggestions as well in terms of um, additional data or ways to show it. Um, this is from Kristen Jewell, what percentage of those of these low income and very low income renters are in subsidized housing that is offsetting their housing costs? That, that was for the first slide that you showed. Yes, so that is using, that cost burden data is using ACS data. And I may turn to Carol, and does Carol, does it differentiate between market rate versus subsidized for that? Afraid we're unable to sort of distinguish um, between, uh, you know, sort of whether, what the form of housing is um, and can only capture just how much they're, they're paying. Thank you, Carol. Um, so one question that was actually asked in the previous um, session, but it's probably more relevant for this one. Um, do you have data about people moving between counties and or out of the region and where they're moving to? There's data at the state level regarding the difference between the number of people moving to the state versus the number of housing units produced showing an approximate 120,000 unit deficit. Do you have this type of data for PSRC or the region? Um, so from where people are moving from and to, one way we can look at that is with the uh, 2019 household travel survey data we had, um, we were able to ask, you know, where had they been living before and where are they, they living now? So we can map some of that to see some of those trends. Um, I think that's the main thing that comes to top of mind. I don't know, Carol, or if anyone else wants to jump in, if there's anything else about movement. That's a tricky one, generally. So Laura, I think you uh, hit it right on, right on the nail. There are um, data, data sets out there that allow us to track, um, you know, sort of county to county migration trends, both within our region, outside the region, outside of the state. Um, but to have that specific link with, um, you know, sort of like housing affordability or reasons for moving, um, the, the, the household travel survey that PSRC conducts um, is the only known source to sort of bring those two dimensions together. Um, also a question from the earlier session, um, do you see housing, housing size needs changing over time? Yes, yeah, so we have forecasted that housing size will decrease over time. I think right now, regionally, it's about 2.55 people per household, and I think we're anticipating it to be about 2.50. Which may not seem like a lot, but obviously, when you you know account for all the households in the region, that does make a difference. Um, so obviously, this is something we're forecasting. Our forecasts have kind of pointed us in the right direction in the past, but it'll be interesting to see how this plays out over time. Um, I think this is the one of uh, we've got. We've got several suggestions which are really helpful. I think this is one of the last 
questions. Um, so would PSRC look into housing impact due to Boeing's relocation? Oh, that's a good question. I think we would have to kind of wrap our brains around kind of what the specific research question would be for that and kind of the different data inputs and sources, but that's definitely something we can think about. Um, and Liz, I know you mentioned there were some suggestions and things like that. So just wanted to give folks a heads up. We will kind of download the chat box after this. So just because something doesn't get read, we, we're still gonna take all that in. So we appreciate your feedback. I don't see any new questions coming in at this point. Okay, well, I think we're right on schedule then to go to part two of our breakout groups. So fingers crossed, this should work just like it did before. All right, it looks like we're all back. So welcome back. Hope everyone had some good discussions in their breakout groups. I know my breakout group has been really helpful to hear from folks. So we are now on to our third and final part of the presentation. Um, so this is really looking at um, what is needed to fill this gap. So this is looking at the needs analysis and some um, estimates on gap numbers. So first, just wanted to do kind of a quick overview on the needs analysis. So first, the purpose um, twofold, one to identify trends and areas where policy interventions are most needed, as well as the number of housing units necessary to meet um, current and, and projected population. So we decided to assess need in a couple different ways. Um, we wanted to look at need in multiple ways to better understand the multiple dimensions of need. Um, we think all these numbers kind of help to tell a more comprehensive story. So kind of quick overview, the three ways we're assessing need, um, looking at supply, so housing units needed to accommodate projected population. Next, looking at need um, from an affordability lens, the income level analysis. So this is used looking at housing units needed at income thresholds for projected populations. We'll get into that in a little bit more detail in a moment. And then third is another way to look at affordability is a cost burden analysis. So this is looking at housing units needed to ensure that households do not pay more than 30% of their income on housing costs. So we will go walk through kind of each of these different um, ways to assess need in a bit more detail. So first looking at um, supply, um, I'm just going to quickly run through these. I, I recommend um, once the slides are available, if you want to dig into this to the methodology, but more, I encourage you to do that. So again, it's really to identify the number of housing units needed to accommodate projected population. Um, to do this, we use the Vision 2050 Regional Growth Strategy population allocations and translating that into housing units um, moving forward. Looking at that for the region and the counties, we'll have it for uh, regional geographies forthcoming. So with that in mind, we anticipate that the region is going to need 888,000 additional housing units to accommodate future growth. You can see kind of the breakdown by county there on the screen. So one way to think about this is um, looking at past housing production and kind of what's gonna need to change in the future if we wanna meet um, these numbers. And what we see is that housing production will need to increase to meet future growth. So right now, um, looking historically, since 2010, the region has averaged about 21,000 um, new housing units every year. To get to that 888,000 number by the year 2050, we're going to need to average about 27,000 new housing units each year which means that our annual, our average annual housing production is, need to go, is going to need to increase by about 6,000 units moving forward. So just one way to kind of think about that. All right, next, looking at how many housing units are needed at income or AMI thresholds for projected households. 
So this is the affordability um, analysis looking at the income level analysis. So quick run through, it's to identify the number of housing units needed at income thresholds for current and projected populations. Um, won't get too into the details right now, obviously happy to talk to folks offline, but it's really, it's determining the current need for um, different AMI categories. And then future need is determined by estimating how uh, housing units needed at each of the, of the AMI levels and kind of looking forward. And then you can add current and future need to get total need. Um, and why we do this, this is an important part of that, is because for housing to be affordable to different income thresholds, different types of public intervention are needed. So really to lower housing costs, greater public intervention is needed. You kind of see a spectrum here. It's pretty high level, but we see really for many markets, even in that 80 to 125% AMI, um, some kind of incentive or, or zoning flexibility is still needed to help bring those costs down to fall into that income threshold. So um, here it's really kind of going beyond those that supply number and trying to kind of tease out what's gonna be needed um, from, from an affordability, from an income lens. So we can think more about the types of public intervention that might uh, be needed in the future. So with that in mind, again, we see nearly um, 888,000 units are needed to meet future affordability needs. Um, you can see the breakdown here for each of the four counties um, at the different AMI thresholds, both for the number, the estimated number of units and then kind of what percentage of total units that is. I have a quick and question about this one. Um, about the Are, path you know, can I ask if, if we hold questions till the end? Uh, sure. Thank you. What slide number? Is that slide 50? Yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So then we can also look at current need. So we see here uh, current gaps for zero to 50% AMI. There is a gap um, in all four counties, obviously adds up to a regional gap number. So really we see that current need that um, many of our very low and low income um, households that the, the market is not, not providing those, those units. So just another way to look at this then, um, this is kind of rolling up these numbers for the region. So we see that close to one and two new housing units will require some level of incentive or subsidy to meet, uh, to meet affordability needs. So about 46% of the estimated um, housing need is gonna fall below 100% AMI. And if you remember from that graphic, we looked at kind of looking at public intervention needed for affordability. Um, these are units that are gonna need everything from direct subsidy to using a multifamily tax exemption to density bonuses, all sorts of things like that. So really thinking that just building more housing alone perhaps isn't going to meet that need that it's gonna re um, require incentives, subsidies, different types of, of public intervention to get there. All right, and then moving on to the third type of needs analysis we did, and this is looking at how many housing units are needed to ensure households do not pay more than 30% of their income on housing costs. This is that cost burden affordability analysis. Um, this is here, this slide we've seen before. This was just a reminder. Um, so this is looking at cost burden households for both renters and owners, remembering that, um, you know, cost burden, if you spend more than 30% of your income um, on housing costs and severely cost burden if you spend more than 50% of your income on housing costs, it's a relative measure. We see it affecting these moderate and lower income households more. So again, here it's the purpose is to identify the number of housing units needed to ensure that we can eliminate cost burden. Um, and for the process, I'm actually gonna flip to this next slide because I think it's a little bit easier to see visually than with just the text. Uh, so for this method, we um, replicated at the regional level as best we could an analysis that was completed by King County and Community Attributes um, as part of their work for the King County's Regional Affordable Housing Task Force. So really what it's saying is that if you provide you new, new units 
for cost burdened households earning below 30% AMI and provide housing for currently unhoused people, that, that there'll then be a shift in the market that provides additional households for some more moderate income households. Um, and that you can provide, and then you can then produce some more housing for folks where that shift didn't meet needs. So it's really saying that, you know, if we can provide housing for folks in that very, very low income bracket, that that then makes some shifts in the market, we can provide some more moderate affordability home, but really with the whole, with the concept of being to eliminate cost burden. So with that in mind, with this analysis, um, we estimate that more than 500 and, and 80,000 units are needed to eliminate current and future cost burden. You can see the breakdown for both um, the current need and the future need and how that totals up to that 580,000, units to eliminate cost burden. You can go into current and future need in a bit more detail. So for current need, um, we're estimating about more than 280,000 units are needed um, to eliminate current cost burden. So kind of the way that this um, plays out is there are about 15,000 people experiencing homelessness. We estimate that would require about 12,000 homes. And there are about just shy of 500,000 cost burden households needing about 271,000 homes. So that gets us to that 283 housing units now. And something to note of that is about 57% of these units are at or below 30% AMI. So not only do we need that 283,000 units now, but the majority of them need to be affordable to extremely, extremely low income households. Looking specifically now at future cost in more detail, you can see um, over 300,000 units are needed to eliminate future cost burden. And you can see the breakdown here um, with you know, large shares for that zero to 30 and 31 to 50% AMI. So again, not only needing those units, but making sure that the subsidies and, and incentives are there to get them to be affordable to those income thresholds. All righty, so that is what we have for part three on the needs analysis. I know we have some questions queued up already. Um, and I think someone had a question specific to slide 50. So I think we'll go a little bit differently than we had before. Um, and I will keep sharing my screen if it would be helpful to have this chart up. Yeah, I had a question. I think this, I think you answered my question, but the 880,000 units, that would bring everybody who's currently rent burdened um, up to not being rent burdened, plus address anyone in the future who needs lower cost housing. Is that, is that correct? Uh, so this is, this does not address cost burden. This was really just saying where do households fall into these income brackets and where would we need to build housing to meet housing cost with with those income brackets. So really making sure that we're building housing at the right affordability affordability level for where households are. Sorry, I was just trying to understand if this included um, kind of catching up for the, the, the current affordability problem as well this, as the- This is looking at future. Problem. So this is looking at 2017 to 2050. This is looking at um, in that future time period. So Laura, okay. Andrew Silva here, that's, Currently, some of our need and future projected need, because we're in 2020. <laughs> yes, for, for, the, for the sake of this, we're calling future need 2017 to 2050, since that ties to what um, is in uh, Vision 2050 with our uh, population projections. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen so I can start seeing faces. And I will turn it to Liz. Yes, so we've got a couple questions. Um, so one from Hannah, Hannah Bonmiller. Um, so could you clarify if eliminating cost burden is for all households or just household making under 80% AMI, like the King County Regional Affordable Housing Task Force report? Yes, all right, okay, Carol, let me know if I got this correct, but I believe it's for 100% 100, 100 AMI and below. Is that what we currently capture? 
Yes, and we have heard some feedback from folks that they are interested in also looking at cost burden above 100% AMI, which is something that we are looking into. Great. Um, question from Brock Howell. Um, how does the depreciation value of older apartments factored into the analysis? Um, you know, I don't know if it really does, in all honesty. I think, obviously, older units depreciate, but it's hard to predict exactly what that will look like over time. And I think, at least what I've heard from some folks, is sometimes I think we, back, we bank on things depreciating more than they do or that they will. Um, so while this is looking into the future, it's kind of assuming um, it doesn't really account for those shifts in building age or kind of as where those shifts are in um, naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, question from Allison Butcher. Does your model factor in move up, move up buyers into new market rate homes, freeing up more moderately priced housing stock within our market, the housing ladder, if you will? So the cost burden analysis does in a way, um, really saying that if we can provide um, housing affordable to folks in um, those extremely low low income brackets, but then there would be shifts in those kind of moderate to higher income brackets. Um, question from Kristen Jewell on slide 56. Does this model take into account people renting down? Yes, so I think that's one of those things with that shift that if we can pro um, provide housing units that are more affordable to that very, those very low income households that it can then kind of provide some shifts to address for, for down renting and things like that. Um, I will say the cost burden analysis, I think, is, is an interesting and an important way to look at this. And I think it helps to kind of round out the, the needs analysis we did for, for this regional analysis. Um, Obviously, with all these methodologies, there, there are assumptions being made, um, things like that. So just something to keep in mind there. Sorry, this is Kirsten. I just had a follow up question on this one. So are you so I'm just trying to understand what would lead you to believe that people who are currently paying less rent than they need to because of the availability of housing would suddenly decide to pay more rent that would free up those units for people who are lower income. Are you thinking that those lower income um, units would be restricted to only be able to be rented to low income households? Um, potentially, especially in that zero to 30% AMI. Again, um, with the cost burden analysis, um, it's not necessarily saying that it's a specific number here that's really kind of kind of an exercise and looking at need in a different way, trying to assess need in, um, from a different perspective and that the assumptions perhaps aren't gonna play out in every single instance, but it's just kind of another way to kind of round out our, our understanding of need. So we understand that there are some, you know, limitations and assumptions with the data. So um, I, I will jump in to clarify um, that um, the cost burden approach um, uh, does not address um, uh, the, the specific point that you bring up, Kirsten, that uh, that natural that down renting does you know sort of naturally occur in the market. Um, but one sort of um, sort of strategic component that I think that the cost burden method um, you know sort of assumes uh, is that so, uh, that that some or all of some of the uh, of the units uh, of the very very low income units you know sort of constructed in that zero to thirty percent AMI category would be income restricted um, and therefore prevent uh, that down renting. Thank you, Carol. That's helpful. Okay, um, a question from Aaron. Um, the, need is uh, the need as derived by each calculation seems wildly different. That opens the door for different groups to use uh, their higher or lower numbers to suit their purposes. Could you clarify what PSRC stance is on this? So I think one, that's something we appreciate to hear feedback on in the small groups, um, for sure. Um, I think we have been our kind of approach to the needs analysis is to look at kind of trends and kind of the ranges 
um, to point us in the directions we need to go in different types of places. Um, I think especially at the region, if we try to tie things up to one number, there's ways to poke holes in that. But if folks have different ideas on kind of the, the messaging of the data, um, especially looking at need in, in different ways, we would be um, uh, would would really appreciate um, feedback on that. So I'll address that um, a little bit up front as well. Um, Aaron, you're, you're, you're right. The two methods um, uh, do pr produce some very distinct assumptions or, or um, findings um, in terms of what, uh, what is needed to address current housing need. Uh, the numbers to address for future housing need are, are, are quite um, you know, sort of consistent. Um, I think that's some of the uh, analysis using the, um, the income-based method may be understating the actual need. Um, and this is tied to the particular data set that we used, which was CHAZ, uh, which uses a set of um, not straight um, AMI thresholds, but AMI thresholds uh, established by HUD, uh, the HAMPI thresholds that can, um, that can be sort of inflated, uh, or not inflated, but just um, adjusted upwards, uh, particularly for um, high cost housing markets. Um, and that sort of technical downstream effect is perhaps um, overstating just how much affordable housing there is in some of the lower income categories. So I think as a next step, PSRC is intending to try and replicate that analysis using some additional um, approaches and data sets to see if we can, and, and to see what, uh, what, what, we, what we come up with that way. Um, I think that we anticipate that um, the numbers will get closer to what we're finding with the cost burden approach. Thank you, Carol. Uh, there are a few other comments and questions. Um, I'm curious about timing of like whether we should just um, transition to big breakout groups or whether you'd like to feel. We should probably transition to breakout groups. Um, and for folks who ask questions, if they don't get addressed in the breakout group, um, obviously feel free to follow up with us um, and we'll try and address those questions. But I think for now, yes, let's do breakout groups. So we make sure we have time for folks to chat. Alrighty. Well, first, I, I don't know about you, but deep breath. We just talked about housing data for almost two hours. Thank you for joining us on a Friday afternoon where it's mildly sunny. So thank you. Um, next steps. So work session materials, notes from breakout groups, discussions will all be available online soon. We will send you a link when those are available. Also a video recording of the presentation will be available online later this month. Um, obviously we didn't record the breakout groups because multiple conversations happening at the same time, but the larger group discussion will be recorded and online. So we mentioned earlier, um, a full regional housing needs assessment draft report will be available later this year. And our PSRC boards and committees will then kind of transition from the data conversation to talking about um, strategies early next year in 2021. Um, and I would just say, if you have general questions or are looking for, for more information about the, the regional housing strategy, going to this website here, psrc.org slash regional dash housing dash strategy is a great first place to look. That's also where the slide decks and everything are gonna be. My contact information is at the end of this presentation. It's also at that web page as well, so feel free to follow up with anything on that. And with that, I will just say thank you again. Um, really, we can't do this work without your feedback and with your feedback and your input and, and your collaboration. Um, so we really appreciate hearing from you and there will be more opportunities to talk about data and about actions and tools and implementation and monitoring in the time to come. So. Paul, Carol, anyone else have anything left to say? Um, I, I was trying to mute myself. Um, but no, I just wanted to echo what you just said, Laura. Um, really great discussions. Uh, Laura, Carol, I, and others, we've been looking at this data for the past, I don't know what, the, the last month or more. And nonetheless, I found it really helpful in my small group to get the reactions and have the feedback from people about how they saw it, um, what they saw, how they understood it, the questions they had about it. 
I found that really useful. So again, thank you for everybody for participating with us, being part of this conversation. It's a big topic with lots and lots of facets. Um, it's hard to summarize in even a, the handful of slides, the many slides that Laura went through. Um, and there's a lot of data behind that. We had some discussions about like, well, what are some of those assumptions? What is some of that detail? Um, lots of stuff there, but um, want to thank you for participating with us. And I want to thank Laura for doing a great job presenting and all of our data staff for getting us to this point. And as Laura said, a number of steps uh, to come working with our boards and working with people like you as we move forward in developing the regional housing strategy. So have a great weekend, everybody.